start with a video real quick. Ryu, Tatakai no Sachi. So this is from the, the most recent Street Fighter game, right? Alright, that's it for the video. You can turn off my computer audio. So that's what we're going to do today is we're going to do our own Hadoukens. Uh, this one we're going to do against Street Fighter V, the game itself, and we're going to exploit that to get access to the kernel and get in our, uh, a rootkit into Ring Zero. I'll quit touching that. So, just a quick intro. Uh, like I said, I'm Professor Plum. Uh, I'm a uh, threat researcher at Semantic. So, any day that I'm working in IDA, I'm usually happy. A uh, lot of certs, just about all the something plus the CompTIA ones I've, I've got. They're not sure they mean much, but uh, my handle, it's got two underscores because I was slow to the Twitter scene. But um, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we, I do want to talk about how to exploit this driver, but to get there, we need to get through some basic Windows primer, uh, rootkit information, how root hits work, how the Windows kernel kind of works. Then we'll talk about Street Fighter, do a little bit of background, kind of talk about what led to this exploit, where it came from. Then we'll talk about the driver itself, how to exploit it. Finally, we'll exploit it and we'll do a demo and install our own rootkit. So, Windows rootkits, good place to start, right? Let's talk about how the systems laid out. Modern operating systems work in a, a ring system that is enforced by hardware, specifically the kernel, or specifically, excuse me, the CPU. Whereas stuff in ring zero, it has the most access. It can directly access physical memory, it can directly access hardware or firmware or anything that attached to the system. And then down the line, you go down to ring zero, which has the least access, and that's where your typical applications run and what they can get into. Uh, Windows, in reality, doesn't use Ring 1 and 2 it, for uh, legacy reasons. Really, the only ones we need to be concerned about is Ring 0, the kernel, and Ring 3, where applications run. Applications can't directly access hardware. When you do an open file or whatnot, it goes up to the kernel. The kernel checks all the things it wants to check, and then it accesses the hardware and relays the information back down to you. So you can't just say, oh, go right to sector X unless you're in the kernel. You can't say, oh, what's in this physical memory location unless you're in the kernel. So that's kind of a reason why, if you're malware, you might want to be in the kernel. Because in the kernel, you have all power, right? If you want to do something that infects the boot sector or be able to do a boot kit, you need to be in the kernel. If you want to hide your activity from like Wireshark, you can hide network comms from even showing up in Wireshark if you're in the kernel you can directly access the firmware of hard drive if you're in the kernel. All these type of things are power that you may want if you're malware. Additionally, the stealth is, is a great possibility, right? You can hide processes, you can hide files, you can hide network traffic, you can do a lot from the kernel that's just hidden from the user. So there's a lot of reasons like things want to get in the kernel. You're on equal footing against antivirus or security products in the kernel because you're both at the same level, so you can cat and mouse game there. There's a lot of reasons that things don't always run in the, the kernel. We, most of the malware we see today isn't in the kernel. One, because it's really hard to get in the kernel. First off, the Windows is doing a good job of making it harder to get execution into the kernel. Two, it's hard to develop code for the kernel. If you crash, or if you've got a bug, which most malware has lots of bugs, if you have a bug in your code and you crash, the process doesn't just fall out. The whole kernel falls out, and you end up with a blue screen, and that's a very easy way to get caught. So writing kernel code is very difficult. More so, if you do know you have a bug and you're trying to debug it, kernel code debugging is very hard because you have to debug a remote system, the debugger has to live on the other machine because you can't have a debugger on a kernel and stop the whole thing. It'll just, it's just not possible. So there's a lot of caveats to doing working with kernel code, writing rootkits, and it's a lot of difficulty. And there's a, most of the things you want to do as a malware author, like get credit cards or pros passwords or whatever, you can do in user land. So not, rootkits have kind of fallen off recently, but they still exist. And that's what we're gonna talk about because we're, we're power hungry fools here today. So for this course, I have written a special rootkit. Um, this is, this rootkit, the whole purpose of it is very simple. It just hides any file on the file system with B-sides in the file name or directory. So if it's got B-sides in it, 
you won't see it. It's still there, it can be accessed, but for anybody running on the system, you won't see the file at all. Um, the goal is to install this rootkit into the kernel using the exploit in Street Fighter V. Uh, a little background, when I say a rootkit, most rootkits are really just a implemented as a kernel driver that's loaded onto the system. Um, these drivers were, used to be you just install this driver and it would just write, write into the kernel. You'd just be able to install your driver as long as you had admin rights and you're done. Rootkit e installed, easy. Microsoft has, uh, over the time, added a lot of security features to make this a lot harder. Kernel signing, patch guard, uh, secure execution of only kernel and process, or ex uh, memory, excuse me, and address space layout randomization in the kernel. So, like I said, we started out, you could just install your rootkit as a service. So you'd say, hey service, here's my driver. When you start the service, the service would load the driver into the kernel. Boom, rootkit installed, just that easy. Then. Windows has said kernel mode signing. All drivers must be signed, and it has to be signed by a trusted publisher. And that cut down on malware rootkits dramatically. It's like, I'm not gonna sign my malware, that's gonna tell you who wrote it, or I'm not gonna pay $300 to get my malware signed, or, or whatnot. Furthermore, Microsoft has now made it, for like Windows 10 and on, that has to be co-signed by one of their certifications, and they have to go through a certain process to ensure that the driver does meet certain requirements and has good code, and pretty good chance you're not gonna get malware to get that signature. So kernel mode signing, code signing has put a large stand to just writing a rootkit driver and having it be installed. So how did the malware get around this? Well, there's a little flag inside the kernel that was like, do I need to check the certification of all drivers or do I just allow any driver in? And malware would, use some kind of exploit to flip that switch off, then say, hey, load this driver. It's like, oh, I don't need to check the, driver, the signature, so I'll just go ahead and load this. And that's how they got their driver or rootkit into the system. Microsoft got smart and like, you know what? We really should watch that flag, and if anything changes it, we've been pwned and shut it down. And so that's what PatchGuard does. PatchGuard watches a lot of key structures inside the kernel to make sure that nothing's being mucked with. One of them now is the little flag, the switch, that says, hey, do I have to sign this code? And if that switch is flipped, it notices it, it'll throw a blue screen, shut down the system. Easy way to get detected. So now that brings us to where we currently are in this kernel of cat and mouse game, where if we wanna load something into the kernel, we can't do it as a service anymore unless it's been signed and verified. So we need to manually load our driver into the kernel some way. And that's what this talk is, is really gonna focus on. Now, finding an exploit is extremely hard, especially for the kernel. Right, like the, the kernel is getting tougher and, and more secure every, every iteration, every bug fix, and so it's hard to find an exploit in the kernel. Even if you find one, you probably don't want to use it just for this. But there are numerous, numerous drivers for the kernel that are of shady quality, and you can find exploits in one of those drivers, and they execute in the kernel, so if you exploit one of them, you're granted access to the kernel. Now, the great thing is, is you don't have to find an exploit in a driver that's running on your target. You can simply find an exploit in any signed driver and then just bring that driver with you. And say, hey, so install this in the kernel. Windows says, uh, you're an admin? Yeah. Oh, is it signed? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll load this in the kernel. Then you just exploit that driver and get yourself into the kernel. And rootkits do this often. Turlo was very famous for doing this. They would bring along a signed driver for a, an older virtual box driver. They would install that driver into the kernel and then exploit it to get access into the kernel themselves. Windows would gladly install that vir virtual box driver because it had been signed and verified. And the cool thing is, is vir uh, VirtualBox has now made newer versions of that driver, but the older driver is still valid, still signed, and so it still works for these guys. And that brings us to where Street Fighter V comes into the picture. You've noticed I've had some Street Fighter V characters along the side this whole way. That's kind of the theme here. Um, Street Fighter V is the 17th game in the series. Yeah, they count as well. <laughs> Their counting scheme's weird, but I think Street Fighter II had like six variants, right? Like, that's the one most of us know. That's the last one I played, sorry. But, uh, so there's like six versions of two, and, and that's how they eventually got up to 17. It's been going on for 30 years now, so this is like 30 years of Street Fighter. And I'm not counting here like Street Fighter Pinball or Street Fighter versus... Tecmo, or, or you know, some of the tangent versions. This is just the main series line. It's a very, very popular franchise for them. 
And Street Fighter V has a lot of features that Capcom wanted to make sure hackers or cheaters weren't allowed to break. Uh, Street Fighter V has online cross-platform multiplayer gaming, right? Uh, anybody who's played online gaming knows that the thing that can kill an online gaming series faster than anything else is rampant cheating. If there's rampant cheating, nobody wants to play it anymore. So it was a huge incentive to Capcom to want to curb somebody from hacking their local content and doing some kind of automated bot keying, or, or I, I don't know what you'd want to do to or make yourself win better, but I'm sure there's plenty of ideas and things you could do. Furthermore, the game uses microtransactions. You can buy in-game currency or earn it by doing certain feats. I'm sure you could probably script that if you wanted to hack it and get money, and so they wanted to curb that. And then finally, there's a global player ranking. So there's a lot of incentive for Capcom to want to curb cheating locally on the machine. And so in September, about six months after the game's release, they added a patch that says, oh, this is our new anti-cheating mechanism that's coming down to the machines. And that's really where this caught my eye. As I was browsing a Reddit forum, and somebody was commenting on the forum that their game keeps crashing and causing a blue screen. And I thought to myself, games shouldn't be causing blue screens because blue screens only happen if something's mucked up in the kernel. So something about this game must be mucking in the kernel, which is not a good idea. Games shouldn't be in the kernel. Games don't belong there by any means. So it merited, I felt it merited some more attention. I got a hold of the, uh, the code, the Capcom driver, Within a few hours, I realized that this is really, really bad. This driver has an exploit. Um, it doesn't do a lot of good things. What it does, is it's designed to load code from user land and execute it. It's, it's, I think it's designed to say, hey, Street Fighter game, do you have something you want me to check for you? I'll check it for you. And so it'll just accept code from the Street Fighter game to run in kernel land but it doesn't do any kind of authentication. So any user line process could talk to this code and say, hey, I want you to run this for me. Like it basically is just opening the door and say, anybody want in the kernel? Because I give you access right here. Uh, when I noticed this, I re we, we reached out to, to Capcom as quickly as we could. Within a few hours, we, were, we had trying to figure out who to talk to, who's the right person, and we, we sent emails to our contacts and say, hey, you've got a really bad problem here. But um, at the same time we were doing that, it was a very easy bug to notice. And that's why I'm using this driver here. It's a very great example of how to exploit the kernel because the bug's really easy to spot. Others had spotted it and they just went public with it. It was all over Twitter at the same time we're trying to reach Capcom under the covers. Capcom was very good about it, very cool. Uh, within 24 hours, they had rolled back the patch. They realized it was a mistake. And so they cleaned it up very quickly. Now I had done some research on this driver. I looked at the code. I'm a malware reverser, so I I like to find the history of something. I like to see where it came from. I like to try to figure out who's behind it. And it turns out that this particular code probably wasn't written by Capcom themselves because I can find very, very similar code, almost the exact same type of same code that's date back almost 10 years. This has been around for quite, this particular code has been around for quite some time. Um, it has been used in numerous other gaming, other games. These are icons of those other games or images. I don't recognize any of them, and that's probably why this hasn't gotten any attention until now. It was really low, under the wire, small fry stuff. It wasn't until Capcom picked it up and, that it got noticed. Now Capcom's got a lot more attention. I can't completely uh, let Capcom off, though, because where they got this code, whether they got it from an, a forum, or they hired a guy that brought it in, or they subcontracted it, I don't know, I can't say, but they signed the code. You, that's not a good idea to sign somebody else's code that you didn't write. It's just not good for your own reputation. So that signature is what allows us to let this code into modern kernels. So I want to let's take apart this driver now. I'm going to we're going to look at the key functions in this driver. It's really small. There's like three main functions we're going to look at. And I'm going to show some code. I'm going to try to stay out of assembly. There's like five assembly instructions. I'll talk about this whole course. So the most of it's going to be C level code. So every driver has a main function, which is
you give me, does the address before it point back to that same pointer? Because I, I want to know that it does. For some reason, not sure why, but it wants to know that it does. And then, if so, then I'm going to turn off SMEP. Now, SMEP is what says kernel mode code must run over here, and user mode code run of, must run over here. And if you're a kernel, you can't be running code from over here. They turn that off. They say, oh, yeah, 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 kernel, you can run code from the user. That's fine. And then it, it finds an address of a routine, and it passes that as an argument to the user land pointer. It assumes what you give it was a pointer to code, and it just jumps to the code that the user gave it. Once that's done, then it comes back and it says, okay, let's re-enable that bit that says kernel mode code can only run in kernel and let's not run user mode code because truthfully, that is a bit that is in later versions of Windows monitored by PatchGuard. And so if PatchGuard notices that's changed, it's going to send you up to blue screen. It's going to shut you down. But we have a window because blue PatchGuard doesn't watch every bit at all times. It actually kind of runs through the cycle of, oh, I'm checking these things, now I'm going to check these things, and go back and check these things. And so if you're quick, you can flip that bit, run some code, flip it back, and patch card would be none the wiser. And so if the user man code that you pass to this is very small and very quick, you won't be caught by patch card. Now, the, the, the pointer thing is really kind of weird. I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but let's just assume that it's a stipulation we have to meet as part of our next exploit. Because whenever you're exploiting drivers that are harder or real exploits, like this one's not, then there's, there's going to be stipulations you have to meet. So this is a very easy stipulation to meet. We just have to make sure there's a pointer to our, co a pointer, to our pointer right before our pointer. Really kind of hard to say, but... So boom, that's it. That's all there is to that driver. There's really not much else to it. It doesn't do anything other than open up a window for you to run user code. So, in user land, how do we exploit this? All we have to do is open a handle to the driver. That string shown there at the top is the handle to the driver. We call device IO control with that particular code, and then we just pass it the address of our shell code. And if everything's happy, it'll run our, our, our shell code, our user land code. Now, that's not, we're not done though. That's not just it. Um, remember, we're not exactly in the root. We're not in the kernel yet. We're just running from user land in a kernel thread. So we want to get our rootkit up in kernel land, and we want to be officially in the kernel land. Furthermore, remember, this thread has to return very quickly, otherwise patch guard's going to catch us. So we have to be kind of careful what we do here. So what I've got here is I've got a little rootkit kicker function. I just call it my launch shell, which is for launch shell code. And basically, its whole point is
but in 64-bit land, there's not a long jump one instruction. So that's why I have to do it with these two instructions. Now I've made it as a struct like this because to make it a little easier. I could have wrote assembly code, but like I said, I don't like writing assembly. I like to use command line foo. And so this first structure right here is the structure. The pragma pack tells the compiler, do not whatsoever put any spaces in between this to make it memory aligned or whatever, because those spaces will totally screw up my assembly line. I really want this to be tight packed, these parameters to be right next to each other. So that's all that says. You can see there that I've got a pointer, a move, the, the address I want to move in, and then a jump instruction. And then down below is where I actually initialize it. And I can just initialize it as a constant. And so I say, hey, here's the address I want in that pointer. Uh, the B848 is the move to EAX instruction. The launch shell is the value I'm moving into EAX. And then the EF, E0FF is the jump instruction. So I've already initialized, I've just in filled out that structure. It's already got everything set up just right. I'll pass that the address of that um, shell code to the kernel, it'll run it, and then it'll just jump to the launch shell function just fine. Uh, the pragma there is something that I like that's kind of tricky. So when you initialize something in Visual Studio as a constant, then it's going to put it in memory that is read-only because it's a constant. But that memory is not marked as executable. So if I tried to pass that normally to the kernel, then it'll try to go there and the, mem and the process says, hey, this memory is not marked executable, I'm gonna throw an error, and you're in the kernel land, so I'm gonna blue screen. So to prevent that, I, this pragma says, hey, put this particular structure in the code section, just, just do it, don't ask why, just do it. And so sure enough, Link Visual Studio will put this constant structure in the executable memory, which then doesn't pr cause any problems. It saves me from, at runtime, having to malloc some executable memory, memory, copy the structure into it, and then find the right offsets to fix up my pointers. It's just a lot cleaner this way in my mind. Okay, so now we have some shell code. We have all we need to get shell code into the kernel. But getting shell code into the kernel is not the same as having a rootkit driver installed in the kernel because a driver has initialization routines, it has some imports that has to be found, it has to be some relocations, some memory layout changes. We still have a little jump to go from shell code to rootkit installed. Um, if you're not familiar with a PE file, when a driver is a PE file. A driver is just a different type. The exact same format with just some slight variations. A DLL, a PE, a driver, they're all the same. Um, like I was just saying, we need, when a driver or a PE file is loaded, there's some steps it does. It has to copy all the sections into memory, expand it. It will fix up any relocations based on where it was loaded into memory. It will find any function that it calls that's in a different library. It has to find the address of that and pull it in. So these, all these things are things we're going to have to do, and we're going to have to do it manually because we can't rely on any kernel function to do it at this point because there's not a kernel function to load a, a load a driver from memory. There's only kernel functions to load drivers from disk, but then all of them also do the code signing ver verification stuff, not things we want to be screwing with. So I'm going to compare side by side loading a DLL from memory because that's a very well talked about process. Meterpreter does that all the time. It's called reflective DLL loading. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do that for a driver. And so side by side, the steps are almost the same, but there's differences. In the user land, you call virtual alloc to allocate some memory. In kernel land, you call ex allocate pool with tag to come to allocate some memory. Memcopy, memset, they're both the same. Um, in user land, you have to, there's not a clean function for doing the relocations exposed by the APIs, so you have to do it by hand. That exact same code works for drivers. We could just kind of cut and paste that code, put it in our, in our uh, reflective driver. Resolving imports, that's kind of a stickier one. In user land, you would say load library to get the library, say get proc address to say get the function from that library I need so I can get the address. There's not the equivalent for that in kernel space. Um, there is what we talked about before, um, get system routine address, which can get the address of system routines, but it only pulls functions from NTOS kernel or HAL. If you need any kind of exported function that's not in one of those two, mm get system routine address will not find it for you. And unfortunately, because I'm interacting with the file system, I do need, my rootkit needs some functions that are not there. So I'm gonna have to do some manual work there to find the driver I need, or to find the library in the kernel I need, get the exported function from it for, so that I can load my driver. 
Uh, the next thing is after you're all done setting up the memory, you set the memory protections on it in user land. You say, this memory is read-only, this memory is executable, this memory is read-write. This step's actually kind of optional. If you just set the memory to read-write-execute, like it's fine, you probably get caught in user land when you do that kind of thing. But in kernel space, the memory protections don't quite work the same as they do in user land. And furthermore, since this is optional, we can kind of just skip this space in kernel land. As long as the memory is marked executable, which we can mark when we allocate the memory, then we should be fine here. And then the last thing you do is to notify the DLL or the executable or the driver that you're, you're ready. And that, that's just the name of the function based on if you're a DLL, a PE, or a driver. It's driver entry for a driver. You know, we can call this directly, but there's a nice kernel function called IO create driver where you just pass it the address of this function and then it initializes some nice memory structures for the driver and, and that's the best and cleanest way to actually kick off the driver. So, at a minimum, we need to find two functions in our shellcode. We'll will find some other functions that make this a lot easier. So my code uses a bunch of other functions in there to make the loading process a little easier, just so I don't have to write as much code and that I know if Windows changes that it's gonna change these functions too. So at a minimum, I need to somehow find the functions I need. I need to find out where the heck I am in memory so that I can parse, start parsing my own PE header and find out where my relocations are, what, what functions the driver actually needs. I need to then copy my condensed driver into the memory section. I need to copy the text section over to a spot. I need to talk the code section over. I need to copy each of these particular sections over into the right locations. I then need to fix the relocations inside and say, hey, I moved this to here. This is over here. This is over here. And set the pointers correctly that way. Find all the imports my driver needs. And then finally call create driver, passing it the address of my rootkit's driver entry function. And then I'm good to go. My driver can just run like normal. So. The code to do this, like I said, is all on GitHub. Um, nothing in there is finding exports. And there's a undocumented kernel function called RTL query module information. What it will do is if you call that, it will pass you a linked list of every module loaded in the kernel. I can then walk this list and find the module. It's like, oh, I need to find an import from, you know, bcrypt, whatever. So I can just walk that module list until I find bcrypt. Oh, that's the one. And then I have my own git proc address routine, my own implementation of it. It's the same implementation as any other load from memory library would do because it's kernel lands just the same as user land. So I just have my own git proc address routine. I pass the address of that module, and it'll find the export of function I'm looking for. That's really the only piece that's kind of different or, 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 or new. So anyways, I posted the code here on GitHub. Uh, I posted it like last week. And um, in honor of Street Fighter, I wrote the code in Hadouken-style programming. Now, if you're not familiar with Hadouken-style programming is, this might give you a hint. This is why it's called Hadouken-style programming, because it, you do these nested if statements that it looks like the whole thing is being pushed over by Hadouken. Uh, personally, I don't really like this kind of style of writing. It's kind of ugly to me, but it was fun for a change. Cool. I think I talked way too fast, but I'm sorry. Let's do this. All right, this is my machine that I plan to infect.
That's how we do this. Now, the Capcom driver really isn't that exciting. It, was, it basically just handed us access. But I hope that um, what I showed here can at least explain how the process works, right? Like you now know this is how I exploit something, get my kernel code into the kernel and install my rootkit so that you can hunt on a different driver that may be a little bit more harder to get execution on, but the process is still the same. It's just kind of like this was a great baby food to get to sink our teeth into kernel mode exploitation. Um, the current medications, just kind of a review, current Windows medications do make this a lot harder than it used to be, but um, it's still possible. Um, many, many drivers exist with exploits that are signed, that are they're approved to run on Windows machines, and those are the most lucrative place to be looking for an exploit to get your code into the kernel. And kernel drivers, just like DLLs, can be reflectively loaded. That's about it. Um, I talk fast, so there's plenty of time. Do you guys have any questions? Any other questions? Thank you for that one. How do I get rid of it? Mine has no uninstall routine either, so the only way to get rid of mine is to reboot the machine. As soon as I reboot the machine, it, everything goes back to normal. I, do, I don't do any kind of persistence. Cool. Well, thank you guys. I hope you have a good conference. There we go.